All right. Well, guess what? Uh, Verna, would you like to would you like to start with prayer? So usually uh, I have the other people on online doing the prayers and the readings. Uh, so would you like to start with a prayer and then we'll go into the we'll go into the uh, first reading. How's that sound? Sure. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, dear Holy, dear God, uh, please speak through us through the Holy Spirit. Um, please uh, help us understand the Word, so that we can help other people understand the Word uh, next Sunday. And please help us always to um, trust in you and and uh, depend on you. And uh, thank you so much for being the Good Shepherd. And uh, this, please speak through us with the Holy Spirit. And we ask this in your holy name, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Great. Vernon, would you like to read the very first reading from Acts of the Apostles? Sure. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, Leaders of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a cripple, namely by what means he was saved, then all of you and all the people of Israel should know that it was in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. In his name, this man stands before you healed. He is the stone rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. Okay, very good, very good. So this um, this reading that we have today, it actually goes back to Acts chapter 3. And when Peter and John were walking into the temple courts, they noticed a paralytic standing at the gate. And Peter said to him, I, I do not have silver and gold to give you, but in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. And so, so he was healed. And so the, so the dialogue from chapter 3 to chapter 4, uh, it's picking up from this incident. What I really love to um, uh, speak about is the preaching of St. Peter is so beautiful in the beginning of Acts of the Apostles. And I think especially as priests and deacons, we can go back to Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost. We can look at this miracle that the Lord does, and we can look at how Peter preaches, and I think we can learn a lot from his preaching uh, from Pentecost onward. So I think there's something very special we can glean from the from the preaching of St. Peter. And one thing that Peter does, which is really interesting, we would probably not do this in a normal congregation, but you have to understand that there were three feast days that all Jews were required to go to Jerusalem. And I'll just write them down here. So you would have Passover, which would also be the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then you would have Pentecost, which is also known as the Feast of Weeks. And then you have Tabernacles. So these three feast days, they were required to go to Jerusalem. So just imagine many of them were there during the Passover when Jesus was crucified, and now they're back 50 days later for Pentecost, and here's Peter and John preaching to them. And so because of this, you'll see Peter emphasizing um, their culpability. Um, and so I'll just highlight a couple places here. Um, if you look closely, you can see this all the way from chapter 2 going through chapter 4. So he says, that it was in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. And in his name, this man stands before you healed. He is the stone rejected by you, the builders, who has become the cornerstone. So this is something we probably wouldn't do. <laughs> I don't think it would go over very well if you did this on an average Sunday Mass. Uh, and, you know, it's it's always better to use the we. Uh, when when we preach, especially about sin. Uh, and so it's kind of a just a point, but it's really a good one to look at. So in ch from chapter two to chapter four, you do see Peter underlining their culpability for the crucifixion of Christ. And and part of the reason is you have the same, you know, possibly crowd here that was that was there at Passover 50 days later. 
At Pentecost, these were required feast days. All males over a certain age had to appear before the Lord. You can imagine many of them bringing their families along with them. So the city of Jerusalem was packed. The ancient historian Josephus says that they sacrificed during his lifetime, which is a little bit after this, he said, on one Passover, they sacrificed 250,000 Passover lambs. And you just do the math there, 250,000 Passover lambs. There must have been over a million people there by far. Um, so uh, the culpability, the aspect of culpability is, is very important here. Um, and, and what I like to explain to people is, is that true conversion takes place when we acknowledge our sins and we're honest about our sinfulness, but also when we have the confidence to turn to Christ, who is merciful. So, so the emphasis on the culpability of the people, especially their leaders, um, it's, it's Peter's way of helping them understand God's offer of his mercy and salvation. So he's, he quotes Psalm 118. He is the stone rejected by the builders, which, the, which has become the cornerstone. And this is a beautiful scripture verse that's quoted numerous times in the New Testament. But what is this the cornerstone of? You know, and right now there's a lot of conversation about the temple. The temple, the temple, the, you know, the red heifer and all this stuff. And, you know, if you look at how the New Testament looks at this, the temple was only one location where God was present. But now it is switched from, from a place to a person. It's in Jesus that God has now manifested his presence. Christ, the cornerstone who's been, been rejected by the builders. And so... And so the you know the whole concept of temple theology in the Old Testament has now been transformed by the Christ. So when you get to the book of Revelation and you read all the way at the very end, chapter 21, it says that that there would be no temple in heaven, but God Himself and the Lamb would be the temple. It's in Revelation chapter 21. And it's a great point to point out because you know sometimes we get in those dinner conversations about you know, what's going on with the red heifer and so forth. And, and we can say that, you know, all this theology that pointed to a place is now focused on a person. And that person is Jesus, our Lord. So I'm going to I'm going to switch screens right here very quickly. I'm just going to show you um, a, a couple of verses here. So let's see if we can find this here okay so i'm going to switch over to this this is a program called uh logos right here uh and it's a great biblical program if, if you're looking for something uh to you know in, maybe um increase your study of scripture you you can also buy the the version which is called verbum which is a catholic edition so it says, I saw a new heavens and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling of God is with men. I will dwell with them and they shall be Oh, he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain uh, anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. Also, he said, write this for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end to the thirsty. I will give from the fountain of water of life without payment. So it goes on here and talks a little bit about, about the holy city, Jerusalem. And I'm just going to read a little bit more here. It says that, that um, then he came, then came one of the seven angels. And it, and it goes on. I just want to find the, the one little place right here towards in the chapter, it says, verse 22, chapter 21, verse 22, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. 
So this is really amazing. So the focus now, instead of a building, the entire concept of the temple it is it's now focused on God himself and the lamb are the temple. OK, and that's that's very important because because if you go to John chapter four, Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman about where will true worship occur? Will it be in Jerusalem or will it be on Mount Gerizim? And Jesus says that the day, the hour will come when true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth, neither in Jerusalem nor on Mount Gerizim. Okay, so, so the focus of only one location is now going to change from a place or a location to a person, and that person is Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so I just bring that up because, you know, the talk about the stone rejected by the builders is now the cornerstone. And so he's so Peter says there is no salvation through anyone else. Jesus is the savior of the world. He's the only savior of the world. And that's a point that we want to emphasize. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. Peter says there's no salvation through anyone else. Nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. And so one thing that's very important, too, is a lot of times people misread some of the church documents and so forth. And where it talks about the possibility of salvation, it's only through Christ. It's only through Christ. And, and so um, sometimes I think they misread these church documents and they don't see that Christ is the only Savior. There's only salvation through Christ our Lord. And, and so um, if you read some of the documents like Lumen Gentium, for instance, it underlines the need that we have to go out and share the gospel with others. Um, but I think uh, Acts chapter 4.12, it's, it's a verse that really should, uh, it's a verse that we should take to prayer. Uh, a verse that should impel us to go out uh, and evangelize. And so, yes, any other thoughts on this, Vernon? Uh, I was looking at that, um, the stone that was rejected by the cornerstone. And then mm -hmm. looking, I was digging into that this morning. Mm -hmm. And there, to, it's, it brought up the same phrase from uh revelation in 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 the catechism catechism of the catholic church on 756 it talks about um the church is called the building of god and that he's the cornerstone of it and then um i so i, I was and then uh that we're we are living stones part of that that whole that whole building with mm -hmm. with jesus at the head right let's uh, okay let's see if i can find it here I'm going to look for it right here. Okay. Okay, I think I got I got the verse here for you. Okay, let me switch here. Okay. It says, often to the church is called the building of God. The Lord, Lord compared himself to the stone which the builders rejected, but which has been made into the cornerstone. On this foundation, the church is built by the apostles, and from it, the church receives solidarity and unity. This edifice has many names to describe it. The house of God, in which his family dwells, the household of God in the spirit, the dwelling place of God among men, and especially the holy temple. This temple, symbolized in places of worship built out of stone, is praised by the fathers, and not without reason, is compared in the liturgy to the holy city, the new Jerusalem. As living stones, we here on earth are built into it. It is this holy city that is seen by John as it comes down out of heaven from God when the world is made anew, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Very good. That's that was the one you were referring to, right? Seven fifty-six. Yeah, exactly. Okay, excellent. Yeah, it's a great, uh, great section of the catechism. Okay, very good. Well, let's continue on here. So let's go back to our scripture reading here. So, do you mind uh, reading the responsorial song? The stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. 
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Let's see. Oh, okay, here you go. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me and have been my savior. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done. It is wonderful in our eyes. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. I will give you thanks to you, for you have answered me and have been my savior. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his kindness endures forever. Okay, thank you so much. All right, very good. Well, Psalm 118, it was prayed during the Passover meal. So it, it, that's really something that's beautiful. Is like, so you just imagine Psalm 118 was part of what's called the Egyptian uh, Hill, Hillel Psalms. And they were, they were Psalms 113 to 118, which were prayed during the Passover meal. So why is that important? Well, just imagine um, Jesus, our Lord, praying these psalms. You know, it's, it's really amazing. Just think about that. Our, our Lord praying, praying these psalms as he was celebrating the Passover with his apostles. And then instituting the Eucharist with his apostles, he would have prayed Psalm 118 right at the end of that celebration. Wow. Uh, and so it's it's debated exactly what part of you know the celebration they would have been used. There's there's different opinions as to when this, these psalms were used during the celebration of the Passover, but you know in all likelihood towards the end of the path that, that Passover where he instituted the Eucharist, he would have played he would have prayed. Psalm 118. So that's what makes Psalm 118 so important for us in the liturgy, because as we celebrate um, Good Friday, Holy Week, uh, Easter Sunday, Psalm 118 is continually used because of how important it was for our Lord Jesus when he instituted the Mass, and then when he went out and he gave his life on the cross. So Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. The concept of giving thanks to God and, and, the, and the goodness of God, it reminds us of the work of God at creation. Do you remember when God created everything, how over and over again we're told it was good, it was good, it was very good. Uh, and the word for his mercy, it's a very special word, his mercy endures forever. It's In Hebrew, it's the word hesed. And you that ch has kind of a rough sound to it right there. So Hesed. Um, and so his Hesed endures forever. It's a guttural sound. Okay. And the word Hesed, it's a very special word. Uh, it has a it, it has a sense of loyalty, faithfulness, steadfast love, uh, kindness, merciful kindness. And so when it was translated for the first time, when the Bible was first translated into Greek, 200 and some years, probably 260 years before Christ was born, they chose the Greek word eleos, which means mercy. His mercy endures forever. It's so appropriate that God's mercy endures forever. We want to invite all people to, to take note of his great mercy, to return to him with confidence uh, to come to reconcile with the Lord with confidence, knowing that his mercy endures forever. So it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. You know, sometimes we we take refuge in the wrong things uh, rather than taking refuge in him. And he goes on, I will give thanks to you for you have answered me. And have been my savior. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And, it, and this is really amazing that here's Jesus praying this psalm with his apostles, his disciples, who would be he named apostles, as he's celebrating the Last Supper, as he's instituting the Eucharist, 
the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then he's going out and giving his life on the cross for us. And it's just amazing. Like when you know the context of the psalm, you go, this is a absolutely amazing. You know, it really is, if you think about it, that our Lord was praying this psalm. And so the New Testament quotes this psalm numerous times. I think that it's the most quoted verse in a psalm in the entire New Testament. I think it's the most quoted verse in the, from the Old Testament. The stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. And that's why it's it's worth sharing a little bit about this psalm in your homily. It's worth telling people Jesus prayed this psalm when he was celebrating the Last Supper and when he instituted the Eucharist. And so we find it quoted throughout the New Testament. Jesus is the stone rejected by the builders, and he has become the cornerstone of this new building, which is the church and the new temple of God. Uh, and it is wonderful in our eyes. So, and, and then it goes on, it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a very beautiful phrase. Our Lord, when he cried over Jerusalem in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 13, our, our Lord said that Jerusalem would essentially be destroyed, but one day his people would receive the Messiah. They would say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus refers to this, I think it's Luke chapter 13, right around verse 30 something. As a matter of fact, I'll look it up for you right now. That'll save you the time. So let's just solve this here. So we'll go to Luke chapter 13, go to the very end of the chapter. Okay, and I have it right here for you, so I'm just going to switch screens, okay? So we'll go back over to the Verbum Locus program. And, and our Lord says, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not? Behold, your house is forsaken. In other words, the temple is going to be destroyed and Jerusalem will be destroyed. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So many scholars see this as a uh, implicitly referring to a great conversion that will take place among the people, the Jewish people. You will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, referring to the fact that one day they would receive the Christ. There's a number of other verses in Scripture that complement this understanding. So I I think that um, this I think this is a good way of interpreting the verse. But I bring it up because our Lord once again he quotes Psalm 118 uh, when he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem and his people one day receiving him again, um, and so that's. That's why I bring it up today. Okay, so blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We will bless you from the house of the Lord. I will give thanks to you for you have answered me and have been my Savior. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his kindness. That's the word chesed again. His merciful kindness, his mercy endures forever. And I don't know why they changed chesed. In the beginning, they translated as mercy and over here they translate it as kindness and i just don't know why they did that but we'll leave it at that all right so let's go now to the next reading let's go to reading number two here beloved see what love the father has bestowed on us that we may be called the children of god yet so we are the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do, we do know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hey, so, you know, right after Easter, we, we have a lot of readings that come from Acts of the Apostles and also 1 John. And so we can encourage our people. I love to encourage the people that that I preach to to keep the Bible open at home and try to follow the cycle of readings in the scriptures at your house. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I would love to encourage people during this time to um, keep Acts of the Apostles open and try to just kind of walk through Acts, read it very slowly. And then also First uh, John, 
It's a very short book, but just to read little snippets from First John, just so powerful. First John is so profound <clears throat> theolog theologically. And so reading Acts and also reading First John. So look at what he says here. He says, beloved, see what love the Father has bestowed on us. This is amazing. He's, he's saying, look at the absolute greatness of the Father's love. Look at this love the Father has bestowed on us. And what is it? The love that the Father has bestowed on us is so great because we may be called the children of God. And yet so we are. Now, this is really amazing here because uh, it, it, it um, touches on some theological arguments uh, over, you know, our salvation in Christ. You know, we're not just called the children of God. It's not just a legal fiction, okay? So during the Reformation, okay. this argument's going back and forth. Is this just a legal fiction? Are we like dung covered with snow? And no, we are the children of God. You see, you see the point here. So there has been an actual transformation that has taken place from the moment that we have been baptized and we now are the children of God. You see, you see what we're getting at here. It's not a legal fiction. It's not just like we're done covered with snow and that's it, you know, which some non-Catholics argued for or, or implicitly argued for. But you know, we may be called the children of God because we are the children of God. There has been an absolute work of transformation that has taken place. Do you see what First John is getting at here? And so he's saying, th this is how much God loves us, that we are his children, okay? And so the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So we live in a, we live in a world that often does not recognize Christ and, and you know, we are sent as light and salt into this world. So the, re the, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And I think that's something that should guide us as we go out into the world every day. We're going into this world as light and salt. We're going into a world that doesn't know our Lord to bring knowledge of Christ to this world, a fallen world. Um, and so going on, he says, beloved, we are God's children now. Notice the emphasis on, you know, we are his children. We are his children now. OK, so in, in other words, start acting like it. Start living it out. OK, um, what we shall be has not yet been revealed. So over here, he's, he's essentially talking about the resurrected body. You know, what we shall be, it, it's 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 not yet revealed. We do, uh, we do know, but what we do know is this, in regards to the resurrection. When it is revealed, we will be like him. And this is really amazing because, you know, we don't know what the resurrected body will be like. People might ask about it. You know, what will the resurrected body be like? It has not yet been revealed. But we know that we will be like him. Now, this is in, this statement is very important because it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and forward, where it talks about how God created them male and female in his image and in his likeness. You remember that image yeah. and likeness, right? And so here it's, it's, it's making a reference back to the likeness. We will be like him him when we are risen in glory we don't know what we're going to be like but we know we're going to be like the resurrected christ in some way we'll have a glorified body that will never ever be able to die isn't that amazing and and not only that but we shall see him as he is for we shall see him as he is uh so this little tiny reading from first john it, it has it's filled with a lot of gold nuggets of theology. I guess it's one of the best ways you could say it. Yeah, it's a extremely profound reading from 1 John chapter 3. So uh, as you can see, it's only two verses long. There's a lot here about what does it mean to be a child of God? Are you, are you really living as a child of God? Jo uh, John, uh, John is emphasizing it's, it's not just something we're going to be. We are children of God. Therefore, we must live as obedient children. We must recognize that from the moment we were baptized, we've been transformed. So 
what do we do as a church? We go around and we sprinkle holy water over our people. We want them to remember what their baptism did to them, what the Holy Spirit did to them. They have now become God's children. They've been transformed in Christ. And we want them to live out that new reality in Christ every day by dying to themselves, picking up their cross and following our Lord. And so um, there's much that could be said here about this reading. Yeah, any other thoughts, Vernon? It's profound. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. it really is. It is. Um... It, it really is. And you know, you know, the concept of just resurrection, a resurrected body, a glorified body. I think we need to bring that up because a lot of people just don't connect with the idea. So... Mm -hmm. You know, just the, the the hope of the resurrection. All right. Well, let's now go to the to the gospel. So the gospel acclamation is, "I am the good shepherd," says the Lord. I know my sheep, and mine know me. Would you like to read the gospel, uh, Vernon? Yes. Gospel according to John. I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hired man who is not a shepherd and whose sheep are not his own sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf catches and scatters him. This is because he works for pay and has no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know mine and mine know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must lead, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to make it, in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. This command I have received from the, my Father. Gospel, Lord. All right, excellent. Wow. Well, there's you know it's beautiful. Good. Sh we we talk about the Good Shepherd, the fourth week of Easter, and so a couple things that could be said that um, it was very common in the ancient Near East for leaders to portray themselves as shepherds of the people so it, it wasn't mm -hmm. just israel it wasn't just israel but really the nations that were all around them you can find writings of kings and so forth who thought of themselves as shepherds of the people so this is i guess you could say it's part of the shared culture in that area between different peoples that a leader is like a shepherd however when you study the history of Israel, you find out that they had terrible kings. Um, so if you read, if you read, for example, the book of 2 Kings, the most common phrase that you, you find in the book of 2 Kings is he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And it's it's the most quoted verse in 2 Kings. And it's <laughs> It's it, it it pretty much sums it all up right there. He did. I mean, every except for a couple kings like Hezekiah and Josiah, almost every one of them, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They were all bad. Um, and uh, so the people of Israel really understood this. We 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 we've had bad shepherds. And so when you get to the prophets, so when you get to Jeremiah. And you also get to Ezekiel. And just kind of write them down here. You you get to Ezekiel thirty four, which which speaks which speaks about a new shepherd. Okay, and also Jeremiah. When you read Jeremiah twenty two to twenty three, they speak of the bad shepherds, and then also a new shepherd who will be a descendant of David. So. In Ezekiel, it's really interesting because in Ezekiel chapter 34, God says, I will shepherd my people. And then it talks it talks about, you can see that in verse 11 through 15. And then it talks about the new shepherd who will be a descendant of David. Wow. 
And in Ezekiel, the new shepherd is called my servant David, hmm. my servant David. Okay, and so it's it's an obvious rep, reference to the coming of the Messiah, a descendant of David. So both of these uh, books use this image of bad shepherds to talk about the coming of a new shepherd king, the Messiah, if you will, the Christ. Um, and so you can see the background here. Uh, and so when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, Mm. It's like it's like he's it's like he's saying all of your history is now going to be changed. You know, the, the 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 repeated phrase, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, which was so often heard in Second Kings and also First Kings. Now it's going to be changed. You're going to have a new shepherd and he's a, and he is the good shepherd. And also when he says I am with a title, he uses that he, he uses this technique, you could say. For this this construct, he says, I am with the title seven different times. And I like to say Catholics know it. They just don't know that they know it. Mm -hmm. I am the bread of life is the first one. I am the light of the world is the second one. I am the, the door or the sheep gate is the third one. I am the good shepherd is the fourth one. I am the resurrection of the life. That's the fifth one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's the sixth one. And the last one is I am the true vine and you are the branches, okay? So seven times. And it really recalls when God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. There's an implication of divinity here, that Christ is truly divine. I am the good shepherd. And especially when you look back at the history of bad shepherds, you, you get an idea of how important this phrase is. Of course, it was David who said, the Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23. Psalm 80 also talks about God being the shepherd of Israel. So for Jesus to say, I am the good shepherd, this is just amazing to think about. He is the one who will now truly lead Israel to eternal life. So a good shepherd does what? Our Lord qualifies what this is. So not only does he say that he's the good shepherd, but now he's going to qualify it. So the good shepherd has to lay down his life for the sheep. So Jesus gives, you could say, the most difficult qualification that you could ever give. A good shepherd has to literally lay down his life for the sheep. And, and, and as opposed to the hireling or the hired man who's not a shepherd, he's just working for pay, who do, you know, the sheep don't belong to him. The sheep are not his own. When he sees the wolf coming, he just runs away. He does his own thing, tries to get away. The wolf catches and scatters them. This is because he doesn't have concern for the sheep. He's just working for pay. So Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And now the second qualification is that I know mine and mine know me. So he knows the sheep, but they, they also know him. And so this the first qualification tells us something about Christ. He's going to lay down his life. The second one tells us something about ourselves. If we really know the good shepherd, I mean, if we really are his sheep, we will know him. And, and the concept of knowing the good shepherd here is implicitly linked to the covenant relationship. It's linked to the concept of living in covenant fidelity with the good shepherd. Uh, being in covenant relationship with him, okay, rather than just I kind of know who he is. It's not, it's not knowing about as much as really truly knowing the person because you are in covenant relationship. You're living out the covenant and you know the Lord. And so just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep. So the the other sheep here are the Gentiles, a lot of times Mormons will take this and say that they're the other sheep, and we sometimes have to say, no, 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 that's not referring to Mormons, it's referring to the Gentiles, okay? <laughs> that's what the other sheep are, and why do we know that? Because all that gets worked out in Acts chapter 15 at a very special council in Jerusalem. This whole question gets solved. So I bring it up just because sometimes people might hear this, okay? <laughs> Um, 
So he says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, and these also I must lead, and they will hear my voice. Now, the concept of hearing the voice of the Lord is tied once again to covenant obedience. It's, it's not audibly hearing the voice of the Lord. It's tied to covenant obedience. So when Adam disobeyed the Lord, it says that he listened to the voice, he hearkened to the voice of Eve uh, instead of hearing the voice of the Lord and being obedient. So um, you could say it's, you know, symbolic speech for how one will be obedient to the Lord. Listening to the voice of the Lord underlines that they're attentive to what God wants, and they, they want to be obedient to the Lord. So he says that there will, be only, there will be one flock and one shepherd. And I think as Catholics, we really want to emphasize this. In John's gospel, Jesus talks again and again about the one flock. He wants his church to be united. And as Catholics, you know, we have a special um, a desire and prayer for the unity of the church. And, and it's really... It's really the one incredible gift that we can we can say, you know, look at what God has done. He has maintained the unity of the church uh, and that it's, that it's one holy Catholic apostolic church for 2000 years, uh, even with lots of difficulties. And so we say those words again and again in the in the creed to emphasize the importance of the unity. Jesus prays for the unity of his church in John 17. May they be one as you, Father, and I are one. John chapter 17. And so this is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. So Jesus is underlining that this is an act of his free will to give his life for our salvation. And also that he has received this authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I have received from my father. Okay. Wow, there's a lot there. Any thoughts? Uh, any thoughts, Vernon? In this, yeah, uh, I, have, I have a couple. Um, the, the link between um, putting trust in the shepherd, the good shepherd, and not in the, uh, the, the person, the hireling, to me is linked to the uh, psalm where it says it's better to trust in, it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. I, I, I saw some link there, you know. It's, yeah, I think so. I think, I think it's great that, you know, that image of don't put your trust in human institutions. Human institutions. Yeah. You know, put your trust completely in the Lord. The, the other thing about just the first time I've ever heard when you said, uh, hear his voice means to obey. And so I'm wondering, like that Psalm 95, we say in the morning uh, most times uh, where it says today, listen to the voice of the Lord. It means obey the yeah. voice of the Lord. Is that right? Exactly. Let's take, let's take a look at it right here. Okay. We'll just take a very quick look at Psalm 95. So we often pray this in the very more in, in the morning here. Okay. And towards the end of it, it says, oh, that today you would hearken to his voice, harden yeah. not your hearts as at Meribah, as the day of Massa in the desert, when your fathers tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. Yeah, so the concept of hearing his voice, oh, that you would just be obedient to the Lord and not rebel as you did in the desert. So, yeah, it's, it's obeying, obeying. Exactly. Yeah, interesting. Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. Any other any other thoughts? Let's go back to our text right here. Okay. Any other thoughts uh, before we finish? No. Really. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so can you close with a, with, uh, can you uh, finish with a closing prayer, Vernon? Would that be okay? Absolutely. In the, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, dear God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The word is is so powerful and and um and thank you for choosing us, you know, to preach. And we're able to preach on Sundays and then also just to, to live a life where we lead 
lead people to your word. And then once they, uh, once we lead them to you, your word will change them forever. So um, please continue to bless us and please continue to bless everybody that uh, is studying this, that reads this and watches this. Um, please bless them and help them to really understand your word and, and be able to deliver a, a homily which is clear and uh, with a with a a message that they can take with them. And we ask this in your holy name, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and the Amen. Son. Spirit. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Have a blessed week. May the Lord inspire each one of us, our entire local church, as we prepare for this Sunday. God bless. Thanks. Thanks, Father. Thank you. Good to see you.